you can start. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So my name is Hong Hao, <coughs> and I'm from the School of Computer Science and Engineering uh, in NTU. And <coughs> uh, I'm happy to, uh, to be here today to introduce our work, uh, Molecule Generation Based on a Latent Diffusion Model. So uh, deep learning have been uh, achieved huge success in the area of drug discovery because compared with the traditional computer-aided uh, drug discovery methods such as uh, virtual screening, uh, which needs to enumerate a lot of possibilities in, the, uh, in a large uh, chemistry library, deep learning can help us to model the uh, relationship between chemical structures and uh, biological properties so that we can design the molecules with uh, optimal properties in a directed manner. So <clears throat> depending on how we represent the molecule data, uh, there are multiple uh, generative models that we can use to uh, do the drug discovery, such as uh, if we represent the data in smell strings, then we can use a long short-term memory neural network to generate the symbols one by one, like this. And But this kind of generation has a huge problem, is that the chemical rules are actually broken during the generation of the symbols one by one, so that we cannot uh, ensure that the generated string can be converted to a valid structure. So uh, to address this problem, uh, researchers started to investigating uh, graph-like uh, neural networks, such as uh, uh, graph uh, variation autoencoders and generative uh, adversarial guns. So uh, besides all those generative models, there is another method called diffusion models. Uh, which is recently demonstrated to be uh, outperforming the, all the other uh, generative models in a lot of tasks such as uh, image and uh, text generation. So uh, our intention is to adapt this method in the area of uh, drug discovery to see uh, how it performs. And uh, a typical diffusion model is composed of two processes, the diffusion process and the denoising process. Um, starting from the original data, which is on the right side of the flow, uh, the diffusion process try to add noise to this original data representation uh, gradually, and at the end, we should get a uh, Gaussian noise that follows the standard Gaussian distribution. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the diff uh, denoising process is going to recover the data from the noise and uh, uh, reconstruct the original data gradually. So once this model is trained, we can then use the denoising process directly on a, a noise vector that sampled from the standard Gaussian distribution. So we apply the denoising process and then here comes the new samples. But as you see, <coughs> uh, this kind of method is, or, is or originally uh, designed for grid like data, such as embedding for texts and images. Um, so the challenge is how can we apply this model to the graph data, uh, such as the molecular graphs, which we use to represent our molecule data. So in our work, we propose a solution to only, o only apply the diffusion operations in a latent space that's modeled by a graph encoder. So uh, our work is composed of four uh, components. In the first uh, component, we use a graph encoder, which is built with graph neural networks to compile the molecular graphs into a latent representation. And then uh, the second process is just the diffusion process that we just talked about to add the noise to the latent representation gradually. And the third one is the denoising process, trying to reverse the diffusion process and uh, remove the noise. So uh, notably at this stage, we try to use a gene expression profile, uh, <coughs> uh, which defines the desired biological activities that we want. We use this profile to constrain the generation so that we can discover uh, heat light molecules. And in the last stage, which is a decoder, a probabilistic decoder, and we use that to reconstruct the molecule structure from the latent uh, representations. So the training of our model involves two stages. 
Uh, firstly, we will train the, train the encoder and the decoder together in a VAE uh, paradigm. So uh, our encoder is composed of a film pump layer, which is a type of uh, relational graph neural networks. So this kind of neural networks is going to model the uh, different chemical bonds as different relations. And uh, uh, so that uh, the message passing pattern for the different chemical bonds is also going to be distinct. And then our decoder model is uh, inherited from, the, from a work called Moller. Uh, basically, it's composed of three uh, MLPs. And uh, at each generation, generation step, imagine that we have a partially constructed st uh, structure and we want to select uh, the next fragments or a uh, single atom to get attached to this partially constructed structure. So the first MLP, which is called the peak atom or motif here, is going to help us predict the next fragments or the uh, atom that's going to get attached. And the second MLP is called the peak attachment. It's going to predict the attachment point and the third one is going to predict the chemical bonds that's used to uh, connect the two structures. So based on this decoder algorithm, we simply design the reconstruction laws to be an expectation over the uh, negative log probabilities over all the generation steps. And uh, other than that, we also use an adversarial loss, which is uh, modeled by training another discriminator to, distinct, to discern the real, fact, uh, real latent representations from the sampled ones. So um, our VAE loss is the combination of the, this reconstruction loss and this adversarial loss. And after training the encoder and the decoder, we proceed to train the latent diffusion model. So the diffusion process adds the noise to the uh, latent representation and then make it a Gaussian noise. And in the denoising process, we are trying to remove this noise. So basically our idea is to train a neural network <coughs> that makes, uh, makes sure that at, at each time step t, uh, the latent representation in diffusion process and the denoising process should be as close as possible. So that at the last step, we should be able to recover the latent representation. So, um, uh, so intuitively, we just design our loss function to be the sum of the uh, KL divergence between the two processes at each time step t. And um, this KL divergence, it measures the distance between two uh, distributions. So by minimizing this loss function, we will be able to make sure that uh, at each time step t, the representations in the diffusion uh, process can be predicted in the denoising process. <coughs> so, uh, because we have uh, make sure that uh, at each time step, the diffusion uh, and the denoising process processes the uh, data distribution that follows a Gaussian distribution. So, after a, sim uh, after a series of simplification, we can uh, just compare the mean and the uh, variance between the two processes to compute their KL divergence. So after this uh, simplifications, this is the final term of the loss function. And the basic idea for this loss function is that we train this uh, neural network epsilon theta to predict the noise epsilon that's added to the original latent representation at each time step t in the diffusion process. And <clears throat> this y here refers to the gene expression profile that we use to constrain the generation. So uh, here comes our first exper experiment, which is an unconstrained uh, generation task evaluated by the Guacamo distribution learning benchmark. Um, this benchmark evaluates five metrics. Uh, validity assess if the chemical structure is valid Uniqueness uh, measures if the generating molecules have been repeatedly generated, and novelty assesses if the molecule has ever uh, has never existed in the training site, which means it is a brand new structure. 
and KL divergence and the FCD measures if the distribution of the uh, psychochemical or biological features of the generating molecules is close to the training site. Oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, we compare our method with two BAE-based and two diffusion-based baselines, and uh, most of these methods works quite well on validity, uh, uniqueness, and novelty. But only digress, and our method can generate quite decent uh, FCD uh, and KL divergence scores. But unfortunately, DGRASS is the only one uh, that cannot make sure 100% validity. So this demonstrates that our method is the only one that can uh, generate versatile molecules while maintaining the chemistry validity. And uh, after the unconstrained generation, here we want to evaluate if the generating molecules can actually be heat candidates that can induce the desired biological activities. So we constrain the generation with the gene expression changes that's caused by a known drug. And in practice, we generate 100 molecules for each uh, gene expression profile. And uh, since similar structures indicate similar biolo uh, biological functions, so we assess the structural similarity between the generating molecules and the known drugs. Um, we use the Frago similarity and the Tanimato similarity uh, based on Marx and Morgan fingerprints to evaluate the experiments. And uh, <coughs> we also compare our method with uh, similarity search, which is a virtual screening method. Uh, and it shows that on all the three measurements, our method, which is the blue curve, is able to generate molecules with higher similarities than the baseline method. So besides the structural similarity assessment, we uh, also assess the binding affinity between the generating molecules and the protein potential protein target. Because we use the gene expression profiles that's uh, induced by the known drugs to constrain, constrain the generation, so we can also assume that the generating molecules should have the same protein target with the uh, 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 active drugs. So uh, we selected 10 structures, 10 uh, protein drug binding structures uh, belonging to three famous drug target genes, EGFR, HDAC8, and HDAC2. And uh, then we plot the VNAS score distributions achieved by our method and also a baseline method called BIAAE. Um, this baseline method is able to is also able to generate molecules based on gene expression profiles. And we can see that on all the 10 structures, uh, our mo model is able to achieve relatively lower VNAS scores than the baseline method, which means better, affin uh, better bending affinities. Um, besides that, we also assess the high affinity ratio, which is the ratio of the molecules with higher bending affinity than the reference drug, and the best bending scores that's achieved by our method and the baseline method. So uh, it shows that our method can always achieve a, quite a decent ratio of high affinity and quite uh, low bending scores, indicating quite nice bending affinity with the protein target. So for a brief summary, uh, we developed a latent diffusion model that generates the heat line molecules uh, with optimal properties such as 100% validity, high novelty, and uh, high structural similarity with existing drugs, also high binding affinity with the potential protein targets. And in the future, we shall ex uh, consider e extending our work to constrain on the bending pocket of the target protein rather than just gene expression profiles. And also, we can consider uh, generate 3D structures rather than the 2D molecular graphs for a more accurate uh, description of the structure. Yeah. That's all for my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang, for the very, very interesting talk. So is there any question for him? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hi. I have, I have one question. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so shall we go back to the uh, slides talking about the 
structure similar to the small molecules. Uh, so you use you said you use the uh, Morgan fingerprints to measure the similarity between the molecules, right? Yeah. And have you done any experiment to validate the statement the similar structure molecule really has a similar biological functions? Because in practice, like uh, like for one example, we consider a small molecule with like uh, same smells, like the cis planting and the trans planting. They are very highly similar, right? But the cis planting is a drug to treat the cancer, while the transplanting is not. So have you done any experiment to validate that statement, the similar structures and the properties? Do you mean like in vitro uh, experiments? Uh, no, I mean any experiment, like because like you have like a training set and you have the measured properties, right? So you can always measure the similarity between different molecules and check their properties. So is there any this kind of training, this uh, similar structures, they really have the similar biological functions and how to measure these similarities the best way? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, besides the structural similarity, we only assess the like, binding affinity with the target protein, mm -hmm. but there is no other uh, evaluation currently uh, about uh, the biological functions. Yeah, I mean, like in your data set, is there any, like any in this kind of relationship? When they have the similar structure, like measured in the fingerprints, they really have this uh, similar binding prop, uh, performance. Did you check that? Oh, we, we have yet to check that. Thank you for the point. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. More questions, uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, it was nice talk. So uh, you used uh, the known drugs to reconstruct novel drug molecules, right? So yeah. um, have you checked the pharmacophore uh, uh, properties of the known drugs like uh, with the newly reconstructed ones and the known drug molecules? Is it like the same pharmacophore or like uh, the pharmacophore properties are also like different from the newly checked ones? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. Yeah, sorry, uh, do you mind repeating? <laughs> Actually, uh, so you have taken the known drug molecules from where uh, you have reconstructed the newly novel drug molecules, right? So every like drug molecules, they have a specific pharmacophore or a specific set of properties which are mainly responsible for showing that drug activity. So that thing like, uh, have you also checked it? Like if it's like same also in the newly reconstructed drug molecules? Um, do you mean like the uh, physical or chemi chemical properties? It's the, what to say, the pharmacophore specifically, like oh. what features, like there's another thing. Oh, it's fine. Uh, we have checked the drug likeness, uh, uh, quantitative drug likeness and uh, It's actually not the drug likeness, but like a set of specific features that constitute or you can say like responsible for the drug activity. It's okay, we can talk later. Thank uh, you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So next one. Uh, thank you. So maybe I have missed it. But so how can you constrain the profile, the gene profile in your training step? Uh, we use a cross attention mechanism uh, to, uh, which is uh, incorporated to the neural network that uh, epsilon zeta that I just talked about. So can you show the slide, uh, show the slide, so the, yeah. the epsilon <coughs> is, uh, the y is the uh, gene profile. Oh, so. uh, here is the gene expression profile and it's added to the, this uh, neural network which is actually a unit backbone and we use the cross attention uh, for cross attention, basically we have queries, keys, and values, and uh, we use uh, the gene expression profile as the values and the latent representations, uh, which is here, as the keys and the queries, so that after this cross attention, they are going to be merged together. So the epsilon is the diffusion process. Oh, sorry? So the epsilon, what is the epsilon here? Is the diffusion process or? 
It's a neural network. Neural network for yeah. just modify. It's just a model the diffusion process. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the EP1 is the model for the diffusion process. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Any more question? So I do have a question for you. So if you go to the next slide, you have compared, okay, you compare your design model with a known drug. You look at, compare the similarity, right? Oh, similarity. So why, why you compare that with a known drug? Did you use that known drug as your target model or here, what is your input of your uh, generative model? Oh, uh, input is just uh, a vector, a noise vector that sampled from the Gaussian distribution, and the uh, gene expression changes that we want to that we want the drug to uh, cause. Yeah. Then uh, this model will uh, generate the new, brand new structures. Yeah. And uh, because we use the gene expression changes that's caused by the known drugs, so we should consider that the new generated drugs should also have the same biological functions with the known drugs. I see. Okay, great. 